går det. Andy Furness. Andy Furness. Andy Furness. Yeah. You're not bothered by how people pronounce it? Not overly. Sure. No, 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 no. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> people, my surname gets pronounced correctly most of the time. Yeah. It's Kia. Yeah. Then you get the Kerr. <sighs> what word are you reading? Yeah, yeah. And then, you, and then it's the variances in spelling. Uh, yeah. yeah. But um, anyway, first world problems, mate. It first is, world it? problems. Good job in the studio. Thank you very much. Um, I felt really guilty, actually. When, the, when we were down at the Aardvark yeah, yeah. event. Yeah. We were both intoxicated. Yeah. Like, completely yeah. pressured you into saying yes to the podcast two days late to come on two days later on the mon- on the Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if he's gonna turn up. He's never gonna turn up. No, he's never gonna turn up. There it was wasn't no until way. I got home that I was like, <laughs> I think I've just agreed to do something there. I think I've had a great bit of cajoling that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. However, how many, however many weeks later it is now? It's yeah, happened. perfect. Yeah, perfect. Right. What were we talking about? Oh yes. So on the pre-pod interview. Yeah. When you were talking about when you were serving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you said, "Let me think about this." What you said. Uh, when you left the military, so you left in 2011, same yeah. as I did. Yeah. You had to learn to be the Andy you were before, because yeah. the Andy when you were serving was not the real Andy. Yeah. Let's exp- let's get into that. Let's dig deep Come into on, that. Let's That's get into deep, it. isn't it? If you turn the lights out and put some Pink Floyd on, maybe we can all talk about it. Um, yeah, I think you know, joining. I, I joined the I joined the Navy at sixteen, so I went straight straight into the Navy. Um, and I think you know, you join the Navy at sixteen in eighty five, Cold War kind of era. You raise your eyebrows. I don't want to say eighty five, Cold War era. That's, you know, I was four years old. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of. Um, are, you there was 50, nothing... are you 52? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Why Look are you right, younger it? than me? Why are you. Look... I'm 40, mate. You had a hard paper round. I yeah. did have a hard paper round. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had a hard career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> none of this yeah. Navy bar. None of this Navy and flipping RAF helicopter malarkey. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I joined the Navy at 16, you know, and at that point it was. We were on the ships, and you know, I did two six months de- over my sixteen years in the navy. I did two deployments to the Far East, six month deployments. You know, it was great. It was like there was no real, no real war fighting going on. You know, we did some Afghan, uh, we did some Iraq Gulf stuff. Um, mid nineties, did the Bosnia stuff in the mid nineties. But you know, we're up and down the Adriatic, not really with the guys on the ground. What so were you flying? Uh, I was an engineer then, so I was a helicopter engineer from 85 through to 96, and then I transferred to become a Navy air crewman. Um, on specific airframes or not? Uh, yeah, I was on uh, uh, Sea Kings, the old Sea Kings, great, great aircraft. And um, I started off doing, uh, did an anti-submarine tour, so I was an anti-submarine air crewman for about a year or so, 18 months. Uh, then when I did search and rescue down at Cold Rose in Cornwall, did that for um, about 18 months again. Um, and then I wanted to go to the commando world, Sea Kings. Um, Navy weren't having it, weren't going to draft me. So I phoned up the RAF, said, this is me. I want to come over and do that kind of battlefield helicopter stuff, support helicopters and transferred. Yeah, transferred in 2001. Go back to the anti-submarine stuff. Yeah. We're doing anti-submarine air equipment. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Sea Kings, anti-submarine Sea Kings at the time. So, you would sit in the back, be a crew of four, two pilots, an observer, and an air crewman. Um, This was before Merlin's, before it all went, before it was a digital, we were like analog air crewmen. So, we would sit in the back, and we would operate all the sonar equipment in the back of the aircraft so there was an active sonar which was you get um, uh, like a transducer face on the end of a cable that would go into the water ping out sound and oh, do right. that so oh, that's that act. physically hang from the heli into the water. yeah so uh, yeah so it would go on a cable a transducer mm. body would go on a cable out of the center of the aircraft ping out sound active sonar and then it would wait for its ping to come back and do all its business the other side of life was what's called passive Sonics, which was throwing sonar boys out, which you then lay in 
patterns, wait for the submarine to drive through it. It would pick up frequencies, uh, and then dependent on where those frequencies were, depends on you then have the ability to pick up which direction it's travelling, what speed it's travelling at, various magic. Um, and then that would be the observer sat next to you, or a Navy call of observers, navigators, whatever you want to call them. Observer sat next to you, he would have a tactical overview, so he would drive the aircraft around where he wanted to lay sonar boys, where he wanted the aircraft to be. And then between us, we would get the drivers in the front to drive us around and and do that so yeah, yeah it was good it was good i think it's one of those things that you, you I, I did it for 18 months it was good i wouldn't want to do it for any more than that it didn't flick my switch massively but i enjoyed it i enjoyed the time i had and there were some great guys on there and yeah we had some good times and we went away like i say but well before i started as an air crewman i was a, an engineer and i used to fix all of that so i did all the radios radar sonar so I did that for 10 years and then thought breaking them's got to be easier than fixing them, <laughs> which it is. So then I transferred to become an air crewman, yeah, yeah, and did that. And then left left there and went and did search and rescue for 18 months. With the with the Navy. Navy. With the Navy. So I was down at 771 Squadron down at Cold Rose again. So I, I went to Cold Rose in July 86 and I left... <laughs> in 2001, April 2001, when I joined the RAF. So what we would do is you'd get drafted to an air station and you'd just bounce around the squadrons internally, go away and do promotion courses and professional courses, but generally you just bounce around the squadrons and stay there. So I did all three carriers, Invincible, Illustrious and Art Royal. Uh, six months in the Far East in Art Royal in 88 as an engineer. It was like 17, 18, I had my 18th birthday while I was away. So, you know, when you, that's magic for an 18 year old to be doing that. Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Mumbai, all of those. It's a brilliant trip. Um, and then I went back again. I was lucky enough to do it as an air crewman on the Illustrious in 97 for the handover of Hong Kong, oh, yeah. which was brilliant. Mega went out to Japan and that was brilliant to do it as, a, as an air crewman. Um, and then I did the bit in between on the Invincible. I did three seven-month back-to-back deployments in the Adriatic for all the Bosnia, former Yugoslavia stuff. What was the RAF like compared to the Navy? <laughs> Is there a, a, a big difference? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, 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 massively. Massively. I think the... the um, let me be careful here. The, um, Just pull that mic down slightly. Down, down, down. down. Um, yeah, uh, the, they're two very different beasts, and the people, the people that are in them, are two very different beasts as well. Um, and the attitudes are very different as well. Really? Yeah. I yeah. Thought, like, they strike so anything that's not army strikes me as very similar. So you, yeah. maybe in the area for equal, no. equally as uh, fluffy as the, as the other. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> fluffy. That's, that's a nice term. Um, no, I don't think so. I think you know. I had a, my 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 view of the RAF was very specific. I went to the RAF. I went to one aircraft type, and I went to one squadron within that aircraft type, and I stayed there for ten years, and then left. So, the squadron that I went to, and the stuff I did with the Air Force. Um, is most akin to a Navy squadron. The, na the Navy is very, <clears throat> um, banter and all of that kind of stuff is absolutely brutal. In the Navy? Oh yeah, brutal. Um, they can drink as well, the, the Navy. Good God, can they drink. Um, but the camaraderie is, is just m mega. They look after each other, whereas, you know, there's certain... Sling the RAF under a bus. Go on, do it. I, no. know, I know it's coming. No, no, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not gonna, sing, I'm not going to sling them under a bus. I'll just push them <laughs> gently. <laughs> I'm not. No, I, you know, I had a great time in the RAF. The, the attitude was very different to the Navy. Um, More civvy orientated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, 
it, yeah, we'll just leave it at yes. I remember, uh, yeah, the, the, everything, they're all different colours, aren't they? I remember my sister, when she was an air cadet, she went to, oh God, I don't know. Oh, no, I know where she went. She went to Lynham, because the point of the story is Lynham. Yeah. Anyway, she came back. It was a, She got a certificate for something. I don't know what it's for, but on the certificate, it, it was like the branding of it. It wasn't um, you know, RAF Lynham. It was Team Lynham and a shooting star. That was... I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. What? Yeah. What beast is that place? Yeah. What on earth? Team, it's team, I, team Lynham. I was disgusted. I w I hadn't been in the reg long. Either. I was disgusted. Like <laughs> funny. I think I think <laughs> I think some of the um, that they don't necessarily do themselves any favours at all. So o Odium. So I was at Odium with the Chinook Force. <clears throat> Mega. That is. That's a great attitude. You know that because nine times out of ten, they're with guys on the ground so they're li humping and dumping and and guys on the ground generally first in last out the first thing that anyone wants to move anyone around a battlefield is a chinook and the last thing they want to carry all their blokes off the ground is a chinook so you're generally first in last out and it's a shit storm while you're there generally because you know you guys on the ground are never going to want to go anywhere nice <laughs> so so that side of life it's like it's very much uh, the support helicopter world within within the air force do a, do a brilliant job shouldn't for i'm going to be biased because clearly that's my background and i love them they're a man's aircraft they're amazing amazing bit of kit save my bacon on numerous occasions but you look at the rest of it you know we've all had that experience where you you know you, you fly into the falkland islands you got to fly out of Bryce Norton. Your flight's at seven in the evening. You have got to be here at four in the morning, so we can all sit around and have a sir, ladies, gents. You know, the, the, the reputationally, it doesn't do anybody any good. And then you know, in the press and the media, what was the last one was up in. I want to say Waddington might not have been. They've given everyone electric scooters, and they're all like whizzing round on electric scooters and stuff. And it's all in the prey. You're like, oh, really? really? Yeah, 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 really, and. I mean, they don't have to be like the army. They have to be different. There's a reason that that there's a reason that actually's there, right? Yeah, yeah. It works. Yeah. In the same way, like navies, we uh, I had the same experience as navy though, but just because it's different. Yeah, yeah. That's always just just something that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and having done, you know, with my lad being in the army now, so between us, between two of us, we've done all three. <laughs> we've done all three services, so you can. We've got a great look at all of them. Um, if the Navy had given me what I wanted, I would never have left. I jumped from the Navy purely for the job because I wanted to go and do that kind of battlefield support helicopter stuff. So what what years were you doing that? So I left the Navy, uh, I left the Navy in 2001. I joined 7th Squadron down at Odium, the SF Chinooks. And I stayed there until I left 1st of April 2011, so pretty much bang on 10 years, Holy give shit. or take. Um, and did, um, I think I did nine, eight or nine Afghans, four Iraqs, and then other did the 7-7 bombings and a couple of other bits and pieces in the UK, hostage rescues and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, what yeah, a, and it was what, mega. What did you do in this, what? Say that again. With seven. Seven Squadron. So they would do, they would have a standby capability in the UK, 24 hour global standby. So if an SF unit wants a, an aircraft, you want to go and do a hostage rescue somewhere globally, chances are you'll have two Chinooks and whatever squadron will go with it. So, um, yeah, it was a proper. I'm listening. I'm just right. I'm writing something down to ask you when we're not recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll forget otherwise. I'll forget. I'll yeah. Forget. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, to come across and do it, it was everything I wanted it to be. It was that professionally, it was that whole kind of you want to fly. So you 
I wanted a, I wanted a tra to fly in helicopters. That's what I wanted to do. It was brilliant. It's exciting. It's great. It's it's boys' own stuff. The Navy was mega. Really enjoyed it. Had a great time. Search and rescue was brilliant. No days the same, you know. And you you are you're helping. You know, you do ninety odd rescues over the eighteen months or whatever it was that I was there, ranging from some woman that had thrown herself and committed suicide off the top of 300 foot cliffs into uh, north of Newquay to a lady who'd had a heart attack on the Scilly Isles to a fisherman 200 miles off the Scillies that had got a, a hook in his eye or you know it's a, or a bloke who'd got hit by a, a bloke on a motorbike who'd got hit by a bus on the roads in Cornwall to, so you know it's everything's different it's brilliant really good and again small units and I think that's what I like that there was only ever, when I was on there, there was only ever like three aircraft, four aircraft. Very few of us <clears throat> doing it. What was the turnover rate of people like? Um, you were on there a while, actually. Um, it was quite a small, and again, when you kind of get involved in small units, people look at you and, you know, you think, yeah, they think you're this, they think you're that because you're on a small unit. You're not, you just... You fly in the same. It was the same as seven. You know, you go and do bloody seven squadron, fucking SF. Think they're this, think they're that. No, we take troops from A to B, the same as everybody else takes troops from A to B, except we deliver them at B, different to everyone else. We're still flying blokes in the back of an helicopter, and it, it don't make us any, don't make us any different. Don't make us any better. We just do a, but you, you just you just do a different job, you know. So. Um, yeah. So how did you get picked to go to seven then? Does it work like that? Because yeah, yeah. So be I when when you do that, you do your OCF. So I came over to the RAF. I ended up I'd done sixteen years in the Navy, and then I ended up going and do a basic training again at Cranwell with like eighteen year olds, which was tack. There was me and another Navy crewman, both of us on there. We I can remember on my hands and knees scrubbing a toilet floor at, at like half ten at night with this other Navy crew, and we we're both going, what "The fuck are we doing here?" <laughs> Uh, but it was worth it, passed out of there. Then um, I was due to go to RF Shawbury and do um, a six-month course crammed into a year to teach you how to do your voice marshalling and all that kind of moving aircraft around. But because I was already qualified as a already qualified air crew, um, we ended up going straight... Oh, I ended up going straight down to Odium. Um, and I did like a, a six-week conversion course... And then I ended up going on a full OCF, so a full six month OCF to convert onto the Chinook. And then during that period, you you put in a request of where you want to go. Um, and then at the end of your OCF, it gets decided where you go. And the way you find out is you go and have a, for us it was Guinness, I don't know whether it is now, you get a pint of Guinness, you have to neck your Guinness and there's a little sticker on the bottom of your glass that tells you for its colour represents what squadron oh, right. you're going to. So I, t I tipped mine over and it had a dark blue sticker on and I was off to seven, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had a good OCF. There were people who put on my OCF that were just as good, who had good OCF, you know. I don't know how I ended up there, but, you know, I did and I'm pleased I did. Um, and I had a brilliant, brilliant time there. Yeah. So you say you were involved in 7-7? Seven, seven. The response to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> talk about that. Um, yeah, they. St it, it was pretty. It was. They stood up the standby squadron from Hereford. So uh, where were you at the time? Well, I was. I can remember actually. I was taking my. I was living in Reading at the time, and I was taking my daughter to go and see her mates, <laughs> and uh, my pager went off, and it was like, sorry. I had to take her back home, jumped in the car, went to work, and we went down to, I think we went down to Carewent initially, met up with the standby squadron at Carewent, um, who I think was B squadron at the time, it was because Billy Billingham was the SSM at the time, um, and we did so, we did a couple of days there, and then we, we repositioned to Lynham, and we just sat at Lynham for, just waiting for, and then nothing ever happened, so they're like, "Why well, don't it stand down?" Then. 
there's lot in that job there's lots of it looks really glamorous and you know you're flying the SAS and this and that there's a lot of hurry up and wait lots of sitting around lots of brilliant let's go and do it now it's all been stood down now let's all just go home so yeah, it takes a massive toll on your family life massive but you know that when you take the job on you know so yeah that was it it was a bit of a you know the the bombings happened in london um you know we were all had visions of yes yeah, fast rope people onto the roof we'll be on the telly it'll be mega no we sat in an hangar for a couple of weeks and went home <laughs> at compo and went home so yeah yeah that was our response to that yeah yeah, it's a similar situation in uh, <coughs> in Iraq, and it was it was going to be the alliest thing I'd ever done at the time. I was like, oh my god, this is this is alley. <laughs> yeah. And it was when the um, Hereford guys got uh, captured. Oh them. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my sniper team, we were dispersed throughout the rifle in the rifle platoons with the, with the rifle companies out there just doing an uh, up telek. Yeah. F uh, uh, oh, I can't remember which one it was, <coughs> but. The op was going down to go into the, the cop shop to, yeah, get, yeah. to get the Hereford guys out. Yeah. So it was a uh, cop here, get snipers together. I'm like, what? You know, like this, this stuff never happens. Yeah. And we're going to go in and bolster the Hereford op, go in. Um, and the job would be take out the sentries while Hereford went, went breached, basically. Yeah. And at, when it, we started off Meg Rally. In the ops room, getting briefed up, the guys getting getting the, getting the bolt actions out of the armory and getting all green spot and all the rest of it, which I just had sat there. We hadn't had to use it up to that point. Yeah. Um, I'm getting asked if I would like any of my. I'm a lance jack, mate. Oh, the lance jack or a screw? It was a screw. Getting asked uh, if I'd like any of my uh, my maps laminated because they give me the, the maps of Basra for we'll be going into. I was like, fucking right, go on, go on, laminate my maps. <laughs> <laughs> go on. <laughs> Some like. <laughs> one pitho, take put two, two of them out, very laminated, and came back. I said, like, "This is the greatest day ever." Yeah, and went into uh, a staging point. Hereford flew in. Um, there, one of the guys who got off. I hadn't seen him for a few years since when he was back in three power. Like fucking hell, brilliant! He was, he was now in. Uh, I can't remember which squadron, which squadron it was. Um, long story short, they ended up changing the plan, and. They went in without us, and me and the team, we sat in a fucking rubbish dump for about 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what happened. They went That's for the it. greatest That's... day, the shittest day, the... like the worst bit ever. Yeah, that's and the glamour, like, oh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't even cock the flipping, you know, didn't even um, chimber around in the bolt action. Just sat in a rubbish dump, stinking of shit while everyone got there. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, God. Yeah. God. That's the, that's the glamour. Everyone goes, yeah. oh, it must be mega. No, I've yeah. sat in some shit holes. So crap. Yeah, I've yeah. sat in some shit holes, yeah. Um, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'm all depressed now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, what did you do when you got out then? Why did you go? Oh, did you full time? I did uh, 26 years, yeah. So I was signed on to 55. So the, the RAF will sign you on to age 55. Um, and I decided, I did, um, I can remember the day where I decided to get out. Um, and I did um, the body repatriation for one of the shakies back to Poole. Uh, Afghan? Yeah, from Afghan. Oh, six. Um, no, it must have been, uh, you know, it must have been 2010. Oh, quite, okay, right. Yeah, 2010, and I knew the guy anyway. I oh, know. Um, and then we landed, we, we picked him up from, uh, Lynham, flew him back to, um, and I'd done a couple of body repatriations, I'd done some back to Hereford. But this one strikes a chord because we picked him up, flew him back to Poole, land on the cricket pit, uh, on the pitch at Poole, and then but they've got like a little pavilion thing there, and right by the pavilion were his wife and daughters. So we shut the aircraft down, and there's nothing. It was a really quiet day, and the last thing to shut down is the APU from the aircraft. So the, APU, the auxiliary power unit. So it's like. Before you start, that gets the power to start the engines, and it just keeps everything. Once you shut the engines down, <coughs> that's the last thing to be shut down is 
to shut the APU down. And when it does, in those, it had happened a couple of times at Hereford, it gives a, like a, it's like a really high-pitched whistle and a whine as it shuts down and it echoed around the, so then the guys come on, they pick up the coffin, draped in a flag, take it off. Um, and we all stay on the aircraft, clearly, because, you know, the last thing you want is four flipping idiots walking off while they're, you know, a really personal family moment. So uh, they t they take the coffin off and the his kids and his wife <coughs> clearly were distraught, absolutely distraught. And I had, so this was 2010, so, you know, I've got a son who's 11 and a daughter who's... Uh, she must have been about 15, 16, something like that, 16, 17. Um, and I just thought, do you know what? I don't want that to be them because we'd done a lot of that. You know, Afghans were getting more kinetic. We were right at the height of that. You know, we'd had, we'd had an aircraft shot down. The Americans were getting aircraft shot down. We'd done some stuff into Kajaki Sofla, which was an absolute... In shit oh I've never been as scared as I have been going into there you know we'd left guys on the ground so we they had to fight their way out a six hour firefight to get out you know we skipped all our crew duty and waited for them they were like you know we can't come and get you fellas because we will get shot down and we had to overshoot the landing so they were in the we were in the descent two aircraft and an RPG went between the aircraft and we're like Christ. fuck that overshoot <clears throat> and then we're in the realms of Oh, it was like flipping Star Wars. There was RPGs. There was oh, I was all kicked off. So I just thought, do you know what? My odds are shrinking. I've been lucky. I've done twenty odd years. I've had a great career. I don't want that to be my kids. So I can remember then we were going to fly back to Odium. I was like, right, I'm just going to go and use the loo before I go. And I remember standing there just thinking, that's it. I've had enough. That and that was my decision to go. Um, and then I put my notice in when I got back here, yeah. and did, I think I did six months, no, three months, three months notice, and then left. I had no job, <laughs> no, no nothing. I was just like, enough, enough is enough. And it was, um, yeah, it was a tough time because my marriage had gone down a the pan then as well, or it went down the pan. So I found myself sat in a house, in a flat in Basingstoke on my own, no furniture, no nothing, just sat in the middle of the middle of the floor, gone from this big family, you know, boys' own stuff of SF helicopters, Afghanistan, all of that, shooty shooty stuff, to no job, no nothing, sat in a flat in Basingstoke. Marriage gone down the pan, seeing me, you know, being a McDonald's dad. Every weekend, every other weekend, you know. Fucking hell, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was grim. Really grim time. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of myself. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah a, it's a. It's a. Yeah. What it's year a, was that? Uh, 2011. Okay. Oh yeah, 2011. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a really grim yeah. time, and then five it, years ahead of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, you know. Yeah, I could have stayed. But would it be the same? You know, would it be any easier? Would I have gone and done more Afghans? Would I have, you know, eventually run out of the odds? You know, you can't, you can't, you can't say, and I can't. What if? You know, so, you know, that was the decision I made. You make that decision and you stick by it, and 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 you you take what comes. And it was a grim few years, really grim few years. It took me probably till about two thousand and. 15, 14, 15, to kind of s get myself back on track. You know, I got some work quite early on. So at end of 2011, I ended up, I went down to Falklands and set up a search and rescue thing for a guy. Did that for six months, earned some money there. And then um, I got contacted by uh, a mate of mine who owned Amber Tiger at the time. And they were missing a search and rescue and SF specialist air crew guy. So I came on to Amber Tiger and that's where that journey started. But, um, and again, that hadn't been an easy, however long that's been going now, 10 years, nine years, 10 years, bloody hell, 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, 
It is what it is. You know, I think we're all kind of, from that background, we're all, you just get on with it. You, you deal with what's in front of you at the time. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about not uh, going what if in. You get caught in the trap of uh, of doing that sometimes, don't, don't you? Especially when stuff unravels. Like, you, literally, what you're talking about there, the, the duration of what happened, it's almost mirror image. Yeah. You know, sat, there in, sat there in the living room. Oh, <clears throat> it makes me mad now because yeah. it's fucking horrible, mate. You'll be yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah. You don't know how you got there. You're like, you're like how am I in a situation? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five years ago, three years ago, I yeah. was this, and now I'm this. Oh, I know what. You I, know. Yeah, and and that's the thing, you know. And I thought I I sat there and thought that's the lowest I have ever been. And you question your decisions, like you say. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. So then you start questioning it. Then you start, and it's not until you go back. So you you know, my sister was mega. She helped me out really. You know. She's like, you know, you, you need to go and speak to someone, and which I did. And even that, you know, there's loads of stuff comes out there that you don't expect to come out when you go and have that counselling. And, you, you know, and I didn't have... The thing I would struggle with was um, I didn't have PTSD. It wasn't, it wasn't um, diagnosed as PTSD. It was, it was uh, they think I had, um, they call it adjustment syndrome. So I've heard this recently, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you struggle with, so on the on the Thursday, for example, I'd be in Afghanistan in an aircraft, flying around, doing what we were doing out there. Then on the Saturday, I'd be back home, the dog needs walking, you know, the kids, this needs doing, and you just think, fucking hell, there's bigger things to to worry about, you know? I I me hand in a hole in a bloke's back trying to keep him alive three days ago. The fact that the dog hasn't had a walk on a Tom Tit this morning is minor stuff, but it's not, it's minor for me, but for the family at home, it's huge. You know, that's there. They've been there worried about me, the kids, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And that's what I really struggled with was that adjusting from being out there to being back here. And then I found when I went outside, when I left, I still struggled with it. And I still struggled with the whole, I was really quite aggressive, not overtly aggressive, not like just randomly punching people, but aggressive as in, you know, somebody would say something and you'd be like, who the fuck do you think you are? You've got no fucking concept of what I've done or what I've seen, or, you know, and that is what fundamentally, that's when I said earlier, that isn't Andy. Andy's quite laid back, quite chilled. Yes, I have. My missus would probably <laughs> disagree with you, disagree with me. But, you know, I was really not a nice person. And that's the reason why, um, one of the reasons why I ended up sat on the floor of a flat on my own. In tears. Yeah, it's that perspective, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're maintaining the perspective of when you're back in that high-risk environment. Yeah. And then you when you're not your perspective doesn't, doesn't align with anyone else's. No. Nope. And then you seem completely, at times, irrational. Yep. Misunderstood. Yep. Not caring. Yep. You have a That's feel of... You don't care about anything. No, I don't give a no, I do. Yeah. Only, the, only the important stuff. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. bullshit. And you have a feeling of... <laughs> I had a feeling of invincibility as well. And I think a lot of people have that. When you come back from that kind of environment where... <laughs> you, you just like... Phew, I had someone trying to kill me last week. You know, I'd, I'd brought an aircraft back with bullet holes in it. What you, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to me over here? Yeah, invincibility or, or inevitability. I, I, I got when I went out the second time. Yeah. The second Afghan time. Yeah. I convinced my. So I remember. I remember this in retrospect. Yeah. I convinced myself I wasn't coming back. Oh really? Yeah. Because the first one had been like, fucking hell. Well. I got through that by pure luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way I'm getting away with that again. Yeah. I convinced myself I wasn't going back, which, right. which I acted like I was invincible. Yeah, yeah. In certain situations. Yeah. You know, I'm not, that's not me going, oh, yeah, I was fucking, I'm, you know, in, in my mind. Yeah. You know, um, hmm. I never had a, I never had a, a, an inevitability. I didn't think. Oh, and then I came back, and that was a, that was a problem. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a, yeah. Well, that's fucked all my plans. Um, yeah, I didn't have a feeling of inevitability. I had, um, 
and the, and prior to my last my last debt was all the Kajaki Sofla stuff, so it was like the high threat stuff. <laughs> Um, Explain Kajaki Sofla to people who are so uh, Kajaki, people have heard of Kajaki. But yeah, of Kajaki, Kajaki Sofla was like um, an area, an area up there where they were really air aware. The guys on the ground were really air aware. It's the village right next to the dam. Right? Yeah, yeah, the village right next to the dam. Yeah, so they there was a bunker system in there. They were really clued in about helicopters, about how aircraft were used to drop troops. Um, and we would listen to them on ICOM. I can remember going in. So we, when we when we ran in for one of the jobs, we we ran in there. It was in the lead aircraft, and we, to to bring a with, with a um, a cabin full of troops. Your manoeuvrability clearly, you're heavy. <clears throat> it's hot. The altitude is high, so helicopters don't necessarily work hot, heavy, and high. They, they lose performance, maneuverability, all that kind of stuff. So we're kind of running in there, and and you're listening to ICOM, and we've got a signal, we've got an SF signaler on board. We've got, you know, they're listening, and we've got the squadron sergeant major. I think it was Hereford at the time. Got the squadron sergeant major. He's on comms. So he's relaying stuff to us. So we're now got the aircraft. We've got. We're talking to the troops. We're talking to the SSM. We're talking to the SIGI. We're talking between ourselves, and we've got all the air traffic radios and all the other radios coming in. So it's quite a high workload. Um, and I can remember coming in there thinking, oh, it's really quiet, you know, mega quiet, which is a combat indicator in itself. <laughs> it's, re it's mega quiet, and we dropped the troops off. And and we we transited away, and I was like, you know, that's really bizarre. As soon as we, we then listen to the troops, they're in contact pretty much as soon as their boots hit the ground. We we thin out, and they're in contact. We then go and sit in the middle of the, so we would go and sit in the middle of the desert, shut the aircraft down, and just sit and wait for a call in to come and get them. And we'd said to them, look, you know, fellas, we need to be coming in to get you in the dark. Anything other than in the dark, we're hugely compromised and, and it'll end in tears. Uh, we get a call to come in. I can remember coming around the high ground and the Kajaki Softler opens up in front of me and I'm on and off goggles, so I'm flicking my goggles up. So we're kind of that dawn's just breaking. <coughs> we got a Sea King, uh, a Commando Navy Sea King above us and he's kind of, he's got a, uh, a camera on. So he's, and I can remember on the radio, he called to us. And he was like, lift the one, you've got Tracer going over the top of you. And we could hear the ICOM and they're saying, wait for the big aircraft, wait for the big aircraft. And you're like, fine, they've said this a million times before. Then the Tracer goes over the top of our aircraft. I look out the door, can see it go over the top. Fine. You know, if it, if I can see it, then fine. Uh, the troops are all lined out in their sticks, ready to be picked up. We've got two aircraft. We're, sit we're slow because we're coming into land. Um, and just as we come to the top of the drop to start the descent, that RPG goes, an RPG goes between it. And at night, it's like a fizzing rugby ball goes between the aircraft. So we're only 20, 30 feet apart and it goes between uh, at windscreen level for lifter two. So we're clear. We're, our first call then is overshoot. We're overshooting the landing. The what, does, what does that mean? You just go. You, you're not stopping. You're going to carry on. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. we're like, you know, we're in the descent to pick the troops up, and we're like, if we, they're in dead ground, which is great. But as soon as we get them on, we're then hot, heavy, and high again. So our maneuverability, and we'd already had one aircraft shot down. The Americans had had a flipper call sign shot down up there. Flipper, flipper was their call sign. It was just a Chinook. Oh. An American Chinook got shot down up there. In fact, I think they might have had two shot down up there. But they were very air aware. Um, so we overshot the landing. So, you know, one aircraft breaks one way, one aircraft breaks the other. And then you've got it just fucking erupted. There was RPGs. There was Tracer. There was just fucking everything. And just as I would get to, I'd, I'd see a firing point. I've got the minigun in the door. I've got the the catch out. I'm just. I've got the switch out. The lights on. I'm just about to deliver the good news, and the pilot, bless him, a brilliant pilot was a squadron boss at the time. Adam Wardrobe, top guy, top top guy. He would be like manoeuvring. So then all I'd get would be like sky. Oh, for 
fucking and I think out of two aircraft, I think there was maybe the rear the ramp gunner the ramp crewman on lifter two maybe got a couple of short bursts off the M60. Nobody got any rounds down. We were just absolutely clattered. Um, and then we're on comms with the guys on the ground, and they're like, "Come and get us! Come and get us!" Because clearly they're in a world of hurt as well, having been on the ground all night. It's gone noisy, but we can't we can't go and get them. So we're like, if you make your way to the edge of the village, to the desert, we will come and get you. And we'll wait for you, and we'll come and get you. Um, and then they had a six-hour fight to fight their way out. And there's no worse feeling than overshooting that landing and leaving those guys. And they were like, at one point, they were up to their chest in irrigation ditches fighting. I remember speaking to the Ato afterwards, and he was like, fucking hell, I'm only in the NATO and I ended up fighting my <laughs> way out with a flipping SF squadron um, and we went and picked them up eventually we went and got them and they were they were fucked they had a really tough time they got, I think they got one guy shot in the foot uh, and one of the dogs got shot which was more worrying that everyone was like one of the blokes has been shot uh, okay. and one of the dogs what do you mean one of the dogs has been shot <laughs> yeah 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 is he alright oh his foot's alright oh, yeah, is the dog alright yeah, he's back with the vets at Bastion. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, so it was kind of one of those places that you know we did that and then they're like, we're going back in again tomorrow. And you think, well, if it was bad last night, they now know we're coming. And the following night, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Who are they trying to grab? Don't know. Don't know. I never... They all seem to be the same. Every, You know, you go into a set of orders... The, the description <laughs> it's all the same that, to me I was one of those people that it that it didn't bother me it, I, I didn't need to know you know I, I needed to know how many blokes what kit they had where they wanted to go what they did when they got off the ramp is is not my concern I don't you know I, as long as I've got comms with them that I can come in and do it if they need a call for fire and we can come and give them some air support great um but their actual job on the ground was just that's yeah beyond my beyond my pay grade yeah I, it's not that i wasn't i was disinterested because i'm i'm not it's really interesting and you're all there together but you know that's not my i've got i've, I've got to worry about the aircraft stuff i can't be worrying about what they're doing on the ground yeah but it's good stuff enjoyed it most but most of the time most of the time yeah. most of the time yeah um, and then it was that when I was, that's when I left, you know, and that experience that I gained over the 10 years of SF flying, that you can't buy that experience, or you can, and I'll sell it to you. And that's where Amber Tiger came up, and we started doing the consultancy, and we started doing helicopter training, and we decided to do, to go down a road of, there's a lot of people will teach you how to fly a helicopter, Cows get small, cows get big, you know, the up this makes it go up and down. There was very few people at the time that would teach you how to operate it. So how to operationally fly that aircraft. So that's what we started doing. So we had some contracts with the mod, we did some gunnery stuff, did some uh, SF Italian Merlins, did some gunnery trials with triple minigun fits with them. Um, triple minigun? Yeah, fits. yeah. So they had a minigun, one in each door and one on the ramp which I'd never seen before. And their setup to put a minigun on the ramp of a Merlin, the H101 Merlin, was, uh, it was really quite good. I was quite... Why would, so why would it, why is it unusual to have that? Well, normally, because if you've got a ramp, you want something that you can... Uh, to take off. And take off to get vehicles M60. on, to get, which was why we had the 60. <clears throat> so we'd put the tow ramps down and the 60, take it off its pintle and it fitted really nicely in between the tow ramps. Okay. So you could get vehicles on, we could get pinkies on, we could get wimics, we could do whatever we needed to get on. Whereas if you've got a minigun and they had it like hanging from the from the roof, if you like, but they, unlike the British military, they'd thought it through, and it <laughs> and it would it had room to get you could get a quad on to the side of it. So it was really good. Yeah, yeah, we went and did that for um, Leonardo or Augusta Westland as they were at the time. Then we did um, 
Uh, we had a contract with MBDA doing the integration of Brimstone onto Apache, Brimstone missile onto Apache. Worked with some really good Apache pilots there. What's the Brimstone? Well, Brimstone missile, so which was fitted to fast jets. They were looking at integrating that onto Apache helicopters. Was it uh, air to air? Air to ground. Uh, air to ground. Uh, really good and we had a great two and a bit years three years doing that we went and trained the Mauritanian military in Augusta Westland 109 airframes for forward firing air to ground gunnery a lot of the contracts were air to ground gunnery based on our background and based on our experience in Afghan of having done that lots um, yeah yeah and then it kind of the drone stuff started to become more prevalent people were asking me about drones can we do drones can we do this can we do that the helicopter stuff still there, but it's kind of taken a little bit of a back seat, really. And the drone stuff is becoming more prevalent. So we we've done some, yeah, you know, drone training, or done some work with some drone companies. How much of a concern is um, how much of a concern is drone use by ter terrorist organisations? Uh, there was a swarm. There was a swarm attack, wasn't there, recently? Was there? Yeah, the first, the first yeah. Big one of its kind. Or well, they're doing kind of. They're using stuff like you go and buy a, a Phantom, a DJI Phantom. Four hundred quid thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah four hundred, five hundred quid, and they were putting a, a grenade with a shuttlecock feathers on the top and releasing it, just flying it over and dropping it. In, in Syria, they were doing that. So there's like your first nefarious use of a drone. How are they pulling the pin? I suppose when it pulls, it just pulls the pin when it drops off. Holy shit. So they're doing that, you know. So I think, you know, unmanned stuff, There's it's in the news all the time where there's South America, you know, I think it's global. And I think it's a big, I think it's a big thing, is the drone, because they're, they're, they're easy to get hold of, aren't they? You know, you can go and buy them, you can go on, go on eBay and buy them for 200 quid. And it gives you, it will give you SA, massive amounts of situational awareness massive amounts of SA um, and like you say you know you could stick a grenade on it and you've got a you've got an airborne weapon haven't you so um, yeah I think you know there was the tanker off the Gulf of I think it was off of Yemen or off of that neck of the woods just come out of the Gulf and that was hit Go on. by a oh it was hit by a there was a British guy killed a British SF guy who was ex SF guy that was working as a contractor it, it hit the bridge and that was an unmanned, that was a drone attack uh, in the Gulf probably about four months ago, five months ago. So, to what intent? What was the intent? Don't know. Don't know. Didn't you hear about that? No, it was kind of, it's one of those that kind of dripped through all of the unmanned. It kind of pops up in the news every now and then. And um, yeah, I don't know what the outcome of it was or who the... But how can you, you have all the restrictions over here in the UK, in, I think in the US as well, or any country sense where... It's legal or illegal to do certain things with Jones, but <laughs> sorry, mate. I don't, I don't understand how you can be policed. How do you police it? It's so, it's, they're so available. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to police. And, and, are and, they talking about restricting the sales of them? Well, that's any, the, you know, that's the thing. At the moment, the, C the CAA, you, you have to have an operator ID, and you, so everybody, you can go online and you you do um, it's like an online training and you register so you register your drone and it gets a, n a number you get a flyer id and an operator id that's great cost you about nine and a half quid or it did when i last did mine that's great but to me that seems like the people that are going to do that are the people that are going to use them legally <laughs> yeah the bloke who's going to fly one into a building or fly it into a wherever he ain't going to go online and go, oh, I haven't got my operator ID. So, you know, how you police it, that's the hard thing. How do you do it? You know, do you do you at a point of sale, take a name and address, and then you record that platform serial number against the name and address, but then how do you go with GDPR? How do you go with, how do you know the bloke's given you the right address? You know, it's a, it is a hard one. It is a hard one. What about on the end of um, actual counter drone technology? What's the emerging stuff at the moment? And what's, what's cutting edge at the moment? Lots of stuff out there. There's lots of stuff out there. Um, I think there's... Um, 
the UK government, you know, the the Marines, there's a lot of stuff on Forces News recently. They've got a bit of kit called Night Fighter, which is uh, uh, made by a company called Steel Rock. Um, they've got some good kit. That's a that's a, a shoulder held counter counter drone EW system. Brilliant, very effective. How I've seen that working. working. Oh, I've, the geeky side of it. Don't know. Don't Just drop the drone out of the sky. Yeah, it'll when you. Yeah. You, it, you can hold it. it the, the drone will just the guy who's flying it will just lose all oh, control okay. of it. Yeah. So it'll so it'll do one of three things. It'll either sit in the hover, it'll try and go return to home, or you can lower it to the ground and you can bring it down and recover it. Holy well, shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a really good bit of kit. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. It's good. You know, again, then there's like lots of detection systems. D drone do a good detection system. So there's lots out there, but there's also a lot of snake oil salesmen you know that are kind of you go to somewhere like dsei or one of those you know how do you prove that all this stuff works you know i'm only saying that about night fight because i've seen it work i've used it and i've been flying the drone when i've just gone i've got absolutely nothing and that's out to like 5k so really good bit of kit so i know that works the other stuff i can't comment on because i haven't seen it i haven't seen it work but i know there's a you know there's a lot of it. So it's a drones. They're the next big thing. Counter drones. That's the next big thing. Counter counter drones will be the. Do you know what I mean? How far do you go down that road? It's like the helicopter stuff. You know, you do. You fire flares out, and then you've got someone that counters the flares, and then you counter counter. You know? Do you remember? I don't know if you're aware of it. It may or may not be. <clears throat> there was a big case. A billion, an American. American or Canadian, I think he was, a billionaire, who I think he got jailed in the States, maybe. He sold, talk about snake oil salesman, he sold... Oh, golf ball detectors. Oh, my God. To Iraq. Oh, my God. He was British. That He was British, actually. Yes, he was. He, was and he'd name? made yeah, yeah, millions. Yes, yeah, fucking and they were like, and it was, a golf, it was a golf ball detector, and he's got blokes out in Baghdad running it... Over things and they're going yeah yeah, it, yeah um, for detecting IEDs yeah so yeah detect, yeah yeah, detect yeah explosives yeah yeah when I was working in Iraq so when I was working in Iraq the la when I I left Iraq in to private work in 2015 they were still using them really you would pull up in a checkpoint the Iraqi police would have this golf ball detector which you could find the information online because it was quite high profile like they sold and and the Iraqi government they kicked off about it he fucking sold us all this we, well one they bought all this stuff didn't work. Literally, and have you ever seen them? Ever uh, seen them? I, I remember seeing yeah. the article when it came out. Yeah, comical, really comical, right? It, it's got a holster. You wear it on your belt. Oh, you it's got to have it. Plastic handle, yeah. like just a molded plastic handle, and it has um, like a, you know, in the old radios where you have a, you had an extendable antenna. Yeah, yeah. Little silver thing. Yeah. S similar look into that, a little shorter, pointing off the front of it, and they would just walk along this car. Waving this thing up and down, I've got a little random cable off it, waving this up and down the car. And, it, and they would never get a reading, it doesn't no. detect IDs. They found, they found 1,500 golf balls. Yeah, 1,500 golf balls. And, it's, and they, they, still, they were still using the 2015. Yeah, but he, he got prison, he, he did get jailed for that. Jailed, yeah. And he made a lot of money in the tens, of, I think he made in like the tens of millions for that. But yeah, you know, and, and you just think, fucking hell, fair play to you for having the kahunas to do it. Yeah. But. I think you got what you was coming to you there. Yeah, if you were going now, I guarantee you'll still be using them now. Oh, probably, yeah, 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 hundred percent, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, yeah, blokes listening to this, nodding their heads, going, "Yeah, they're still, they're still yeah, using them now. yeah, still using them. Still got the golf balls in my bag." <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then um, yeah, we started. Amber Tiger was doing. We're still doing all those bits and pieces. Still doing the drone still, stuff. You're still doing the golf ball detectors. Yeah? yeah, still doing the golf ball detectors. <laughs> yeah, I've got the new model. It has got two antennas. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and that was when we we kind of we got into the the gin world after that as well. Yeah, yeah. So same business partner? Um, no, no. So uh, my business partner for the gin is uh, uh, an ex bootneck. Oh. So we were we kind of we met up doing something else, and then we we went out, got on the piss, and thought. Let's have a go at doing so. We were, we were, we were going to do something techy, like let's do a really stealthy drone, you know, see through E, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
he works in the defence in sector as well. And we were like, do you know what? <laughs> I'm done with the defence sector. It's like it's a flipping ball lake. And and we were pissed and we were like, So we're gonna make some gin. We we're like, How hard can it be? <laughs> right, fuck it, we'll do it. So that was the decision made. So we, we started uh, Templar Spirit and um we went down and found a distillery in South Wales, in Usk. Oh, nice. In Usk. Uh, when I met when I met Christos down there, and uh, we went in there. I went down to um, Usk. We got on the piss the night before, so we rocked up at the distillery with a, with a honking hangover. Goes in to see the guy about distillery. He's like, how much do you want? And we look, kind of looked at each other, and we went, I don't know, 500 litres? Yeah, go, yeah, 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 I can do 500 litres. Bargain. Um, what do you want it to taste of? And we were like, <laughs> uh, gin, you flipping dullard. <laughs> and he was like, now what, um, what, what um, botanicals do you want in it? He goes, uh, c citrus? Yeah, 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 put some of that in it. So it, we left him to it, and then we went away, came back, and we did a blind taste test. And um, I couldn't believe how good it is. I, I took it home to my missus, who's a proper gin fairy, gave her, gave her the three the three that down to the final three and she picked the one that we'd picked and that's what's ended up in there so we did a um and and chris my business partner he designed all the bottles he designed all the labels yeah. um and it started off as like a purple square bottle with castellated feet and it because we wanted to go down that whole templar knights templar kind of thing it looks like a percussion cup now it looks good yeah Go on, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, we did that, and then we thought we'll keep going with the 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 black and gold came out, um, and it's been really well received. Wow. So we do a London Dry, which is that one you've got in your hand there, which is a forty percent, um, and then we do a fifty-seven percent Navy Strength as well. Yeah, yeah, it's good shit. It's good shit. Yeah. So um, that's the that's the forty you've got there. So what? So it's London Dry. What was that? So London Dry. It's all explained on the back of the label. Oh yeah. So um, it used to be that it would be made. It doesn't have to be made in London anymore. It's just a method of making the gin. Um, so our navy strength. It's a navy strength because years gone by, they would store the alcohol in the next compartment to the gunpowder, and if there was a leak in the alcohol, it had to be above. 57 57 or above alcohol content and the gunpowder would still work <laughs> so that's why that's where the navy strength comes from that is quality. yeah yeah that's where the navy strength comes from so we've got the, the the 40 which you've got there the navy strength is the 57 and we're gonna we're launching shortly a navy strength spiced rum as well dirty templar rum and then we will also do early part of next year a navy strength vodka as well. Oh my god! Fifty-seven vodka, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been really well received. Um, we're in a couple of pubs in a couple of places. Um, yeah, yeah. When did when did you start it? February. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. February's but, gone. Yeah, yeah. This year, yeah, yeah. God, I thought we've been around for longer than no, that. No, uh, you know our social. We've learned a lot from it. Um, and I, you know, the defence stuff's great. Amber Tiger's great. This is just. It's fun. It's you know. It's I've learned loads from it. I'm on a distilling course next week because I thought one of us better learn how to how to distill it. So I'm on a distilling course next week, um, and then we'll look at starting our own distillery at some point in the future. We'll have a Templar distillery, and yeah, and and we you know we've got people interested from China Whites and various other clubs to pr provide them. You know, if you can, we we spoke to a club in Ibiza, which which kind of and they go through high season 1500 bottles of gin a weekend jesus a weekend one club yeah 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 it's a big it's called ants it's a big club in ibiza apparently i i'm i'm 52 i'm way past the discotheque time that my that my discotheque. that ship sailed my <laughs> that ship that ship sailed my friend but um <laughs> yeah but <gasps> yeah so um yeah the you know the this it's a there's a lot of gin out there. It's a really you know, not really affected by the lockdown because you can buy it online. P 
people buy it online. You know, it's a it's a huge industry. Do in you the have UK. similar regulatory hoops to jump through to tracking where it's coming from, where it's going, to what tobacco is? Uh, not as much as tobacco. Tobacco is really because oh we looked at doing. Uh, we spoke to a guy out in Cuba about cigars. So we wanted to bring some cigars in and we would do the lot, you know, as Templar cigars and with the box and the black and the gold, it'd look really good. We need to have a fucking conversation. Right, <laughs> yeah. So we've got that capability. <laughs> it's you then... know combat. You know combat, I'm behind combat cigars, me plus two others. Com oh, yeah. You know this? No. No. Okay. New as well. Really? Similar timelines, combat cigars, yeah. Well, we'll have a chat with yeah. that, definitely. You will fucking love the backstory. Really? Yeah. Family in Colombia, been rolling for two hundred years. Mega. They only so our cigars. They're only rolled for us. They're only we're the only people you can get them from in the UK. You fucking love it, mate. Brilliant quality. quality. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I'll Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, mate. That's there's you know quality. The, there's a lot of stuff. You know, there's there's you. And they're those. fucking awesome. That's the thing. Yeah. That, you know, there's a lot of guys that y you've done those cigars. You know, we've done this. You've got co uh, Green Beret Coffee. You've got Contact. You've got all these guys that are doing these kind of, and they've they've moved away from the military. They, they're still trading on the military stuff, but you know, I think it's mega. I think it's brilliant. People are just more entrepreneurial. Now. I, I, well, I no, think they're so. more willing to take a risk. But I think, I think it's. I think the only reason is because it's it, because internet, and you can see it happening. You can yeah. see it's just more. Well, internet. One from the oh, you can see other brands doing it. Yeah. Oh yeah, like you said, Green Beret Coffee, Contact Coffee, Sinita's Guild, all of those. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they can do it, so I'll try, I'll try doing yeah. that because they make they've been successful. And the other one is all the information set to set up a company. You, you know, before if you think before the internet. Yeah, yeah. Like setting up a company, you'd be like, ooh, yeah, that yeah, seems yeah. like it's difficult, or you know, whatever. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, it's it, not. It, it's it really no, isn't. not at all. It and really you, and you think you know the the advent of social media, love it or hate it. Yeah, out in six months, you know, we've got over four and a half thousand followers on on Instagram, and they they interact. You're interacting on them. Day Facebook has been really good for us as well. Love it or hate it, um, and I think that's the way to market this stuff. You know, to get interaction with people that you can kind of what we do with ours. You know, we put a little card in with each bottle that we sell. You know, take the photo of Templar, and wherever you know, best one wins. Best one at the end of the year wins a bottle. Uh, and we also do limited edition, so we did a commando bottle for the core birthday, and we did uh, a poppy version for remembrance. So the the commando one's got green wax, oh yeah, and a commando dagger on the front. I know this up to the camera a minute. Um, yes, and the poppy one has got um, red wax and a, and a poppy on the front, and we've it's ten pound from each bottle goes to the Royal Navy and Royal Marines charity from the limited edition bottles. So it was nice to kind of tie it in, give something back. They look after, you know, especially with my background as a as an ex-Matlo, Chris as an ex-Bootneck, that it kind of tied in nicely with that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's good. That's cool. It's man. good. Right. Yeah, it's right. good. Um, and thank you for the bottle. That's all right. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did think you'd been around for longer than that. Yeah. No, it is. It, well, that's you know, Don't we're clearly doing that. something right, aren't we? But it's also this. It sounds like it's an old school brand. Yeah. Templar gin. Yeah, like Templar gin. <laughs> yeah, we've been around for donkeys, and I, I can't even remember where we came up with it. I, you know, we've spoken to a couple of companies that are interested in it. They're going, "Fuck your marketing! How did you? Come, how much did you throw at marketing to get you know, and brand design and brand awareness to get that?" And we were like. Mm, we were sat on a gym ball in Chris's office <laughs> yeah. and we came up with it and they were, you know, yeah, we've kind of, we've, we've just kind of hit it nicely. The brand's good. You know, it's been really well received and more importantly, it tastes good as well. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice Mediterranean tonic. With, oh, check me out. Nice Mediterranean tonic with a bit of grapefruit. Belting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good, yeah. Good. yeah. What have we not covered? What have we not covered? Uh, that we wanted to cover. I think we've done everything, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Templar Gin, how do people um, find it? You can go on our website and get Templar Gin, uh, templarspirit.co.uk on there. Uh, we're going to do a Black Friday sale. 
coming up shortly. Um, yeah, and then just keep an eye out for the rum. We're going to do a rum. We want to do a, you know, we've been really well received. We're really lucky that we've got the ex-military community that kind of get behind. They're like, oh, the lad's doing it. We'll get behind it. And um, yeah, but it's great. You know, the brand's good. Um, yeah, so if you want to go and get it on there and we'll ship it out to your ships all around the UK, not drama. Great. What about overseas? We can do overseas. Postage is a, a bit of a drama and clearly shipping alcohol, especially oh, shipping 57% yeah. alcohol. But it's doable. It's doable. It just may take a little longer, but we can do it overseas, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Mate, been a pleasure. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, it's not as bad as I thought. I thought I was going to get reamed there, <laughs> but it's all right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had a good time. Thank yeah. you very much. No worries, mate. Cheers. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never, they never get released to the public I don't know why I had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of H-Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.